Good afternoon. I'm Kim Bottomley, the president of Wellesley College. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this public dialogue on addressing global inequality. It's really wonderful to see so many people here today, including, of course, our current and past fellows of the Albright Institute, Wellesley students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends, and I'm delighted to welcome our participants from around the world who are tuning in via live stream. Let me also extend a warm welcome to our distinguished guests on stage who have joined us for this important conversation. Today's discussion is a part of our Impact Albright Symposium, which recognizes and celebrates the incredible influence that the Madeleine K. Albright Institute for Global Affairs has had on Wellesley women and on the world since it began in 2010. It is an honor to host our distinguished guests today, and I'm glad that we are supporting this dialogue. Wellesley is the perfect place to bring together experts, with diverse perspectives and backgrounds to engage in a dialogue about one of the most critical issues of our time. This approach is how we teach our students at Wellesley. It is what the Albright Institute does so well, and it is exactly what is needed in this world if we are going to address successfully the global challenges of the 21st century. At Wellesley, we educate students to make a difference in the world. Part of living our mission involves having the confidence to engage in difficult conversations on complex topics, just as we are about to do this afternoon. I'm grateful to our distinguished guests for the valuable perspectives and insights they bring to addressing global inequality. It is my pleasure now to introduce our panelists, beginning on your far right with Secretary Albright. Madeline Corbell Albright, Wellesley class of 1959, served as U.S. Secretary of State from 1997 to 2001, becoming at that time the highest ranking woman in the history of the United States government. From 1993 to 1997, she served as a U.S. permanent representative to the United Nations and as a member of the President's Cabinet. In addition to earning a B.A. with honors from Wellesley College, she holds master's and doctor degrees from Columbia University's Departments of Public Health and Government, as well as a certificate from its Russian Institute. She chairs both the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs and the Pew Global Attitudes Project, and serves as president of the Truman Scholarship Foundation. In 2012, President Obama presented to Secretary Albright the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. Secretary Albright, thank you for the example you have set for generations of Wellesley women and for the high standard you have set for leaders around the globe. Christine Lagarde. Christine Lagarde is the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, a position she has held since July 2011 she is the first woman to lead the IMF. <laughs> Madame Lagarde joined the French government in 2005 as Minister for Foreign Trade. After briefly serving as Minister for Agriculture and Fisheries, she became, she became in two th June 2007 the first woman to hold the post of Finance and Economy Minister of a G7 country. 
As a member of the G20, Christine Lagarde was involved in the group's management of the financial crisis, helping to foster international policies and to strengthen global economic governance. As chairman of the G20, when France took over its presidency for the year 2011, Christine Lagarde launched a wide-ranging agenda to reform the international monetary system. Christine Lagarde holds a law degree from the University Paris 10, as well as a master's degree from the Political Science Institute in Aix-en-Provence. Sri Mulyani Indrawadi. Sri Mulyani Indrawadi is the managing director and chief operating officer of the World Bank Group. Prior to joining the World Bank in June 2010, she served as Indonesia's Minister of Finance in addition to being the Coordinating Minister of Economic Affairs. She previously led the Indonesian National Development Planning Agency and served as Executive Director at the International Monetary Fund, as well as a faculty member at the University of Indonesia and at Andrew Young School of Public Policy at Georgia State University. Sri Mulyani Indrawati holds a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois and a BA in economics from the University of Indonesia. <laughs> Mark Malik Brown. Mark Malik Brown is the former Deputy, Deputy Secretary General and Chief of Staff of the UN under Kofi Annan, as well as administrator of the UNDP, where he led the UN's development efforts around the world. Mark Malik Brown served as Minister of State in the Foreign Office and was a member of Gordon Brown's cabinet. He also has held leadership positions at George Soros' investment funds, the World Bank, and the World Economic Forum. He began his career as a journalist for The Economist. Today, Mark Malik Brown sits in the House of Lords and is active in the business and nonprofit worlds. He chairs or is on a number of nonprofit boards and is former chair of the Royal Africa Society. Knighted in 2007 for his international efforts, Mark Malik Brown is the author of The Unfinished Global Revolution and in 2005, Time Magazine put him on its list of the 100 most influential people in the world. <laughs> and immediate, immediately to my left is Heather Long, Wellesley College class of 2004, and the senior... <laughs> and the senior economy writer and editor for CNN Money. She will serve as a moderator of today's discussion. Prior to joining CNN, Heather Long was an assistant editor at The Guardian and deputy editor at The Patriot News in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which won a Pulitzer Prize for local reporting. She holds a master's degree in financial e economics from Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. I want to thank all of our distinguished guests for being here today and for bringing their perspectives to help us better understand and address global inequality. And now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Heather Long. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kim. Uh, a friend texted me just before I came on stage a very important question, and it's one that many world leaders have asked, including Vladimir Putin, and that is, what pin is Madeleine Albright wearing today? <laughs> <laughs> so she's famous for her pin. She indeed has on a beautiful one today. It was gifted to her this weekend. Uh, for those who can't see it, it is a, a globe with sort of shooting stars coming out and then these little jewels to represent stars. And it was given to her in honor of the Albright Institute, the seventh year we are in of the Albright Institute. <laughs> So 
So those stars are supposed to represent all of the amazing fellows going out into the world and doing their work. But I think as I look at that pen, it also reminds me how good Madeleine Albright is at shining a light around the world on the toughest questions and issues of our time. And that is certainly what we're doing today with global inequality, a huge topic. It's a really interesting time to be having this discussion. One of the themes that has come up over and over again in the panels we've had this weekend is how we have made some tremendous strides as a global community in terms of addressing poverty and addressing inequality. The World Bank, Ms. Indrawati's organization, put out a report recently that says, for the first time in history, less than 10% of the world is living in extreme poverty, and that which is defined as $1.90 a day. So that's still a large number, but we've come very, very far. Similarly, the United Nations, where Lord Mullock Brown has spent a lot of time, came together in the fall to put together 17 SDGs, or Sustainable Development Goals. And one of those is to reduce inequality. So world leaders are coming together and they are recognizing that we need to address this problem. At the same time, you can point to any report from any organization on this stage and beyond that shows how vast the divide in the United States and around the world is on inequality. Just to cite a recent one, uh, Oxfam really put out a report just before the World Economic Forum that stunned a lot of people. Uh, their report put it this way, the world's 62 richest billionaires have as much wealth as half of the world population. And if you extend that to the top 1% of the world's richest people, they have more than everyone else combined. So we are very aware of the disparities that are out there today. So to kick off the panel, I thought we'd take a page from Silicon Valley, not that they have all the answers, but we would, uh, we would ask each of you to do sort of a 30-second elevator pitch. And I know this is a big topic, that's why we're gonna spend an hour and a half on it, but to really start off and give us your 30-second, when you, part of your job is to go around the world and convince people that we need to tackle inequality and that it can be solved. And so what, how do you kick that discussion off? And we'll go down the panel, start with Lord Mullock Brown. Well, actually, when you go around the world, it, you usually have the length of a plane ride to convince people. <laughs> so it, it's eight Fair hours enough. across the Atlantic, so be careful. But in, 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 in 30 seconds, you know, inequality's sort of most extreme expression is extreme poverty, and that is coming down very, very rapidly. Uh, it was halved and much more as a proportion of, of, of global um, people living in poverty was halved as a percentage uh, in the period before 2015. Inequality is a very complicated thing uh, because an Oxfam headline of 62 people having the same worth as half the world hides behind it a whole set of complexities that we need a lot more flaws on the elevator ride to complete. But I think the core point just is to say that however false in some ways the Oxfam headline is, it reminds us all in a very powerful way that there is huge differences of wealth out there which are unconscionable at this time in human history. Thank you. Well, inequality is a sign of broken society, Helen. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the evidence base there is a correlation between growth or inequality. All country, regardless you are low, middle, upper income country, there is always a sense of inequality. But the issue in this case is, if inequality in such a very severe, that it can even harm the effort to address the issue of poverty, and even can create a social conflict. I think we have quite a lot of example uh, in which the injustice, whether this is perceived or real, can really create the social conflict. So inequality has become a disease. It is not only a measurement of the equality of income, but most importantly, that's become morally wrong if this inequality is actually touch the issue of inequality of opportunity. Mm. Because then you're not allowing people, or people can be disadvantaged only because they are born as a girl in a rural area, in a parent which is not educated, and there is no hope in your generation and next to address this 
poor condition that you're having because they cannot get the access. So that's the inequality of opportunity. And that's why within the bank, we are not, no longer just declaring the poverty, ending poverty as our goal. Under President Kim, we are talking about sharing prosperity. We measure the bottom 40% hmm. that need to grow faster than the average of the income of the people in any economy because that will give a sign that inequality can be addressed or there is a progress on the bottom 40%. Thank you. Well, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I would like to clarify one thing about these 62 people whose uh, wealth and income uh, exceeds that of half of humanity is that 53 of them are male. Hmm. <laughs> Which takes me to my second point. <laughs> yeah. So my second point is that inequality, just like poverty for that matter, but inequality is sexist. Hmm. And one way to tackle inequality is actually to reduce the gender gap and to make sure that women have the same opportunities and eventually the same income for same skills and jobs as men. You would reduce inequality by a big, big amount. I've got a few other points, but you said a few seconds, so I'll stop here. Uh, I operate on the basis that we are all the same. And as I traveled around the world and I would meet people in fancy rooms or people in refugee camps, it all, I always thought, well, we are all constructed the same, we are the same. So inequality is morally wrong, but it's also dangerous. And it's dangerous because with technology, the poor know what the rich have now. And I think it creates uh, all kinds of discontinuities in terms of the way that states operate. Uh, and I think that we are, to get people motivated these days, we do have to talk about the danger. And there is, it's wrong, but it's also dangerous. Yeah. <clears throat> I thought we'd involve. <laughs> I thought we'd do a bit of a survey of the audience for a minute. So this is gonna be a raise your hand exercise if you agree or not. Um, so one of the questions with the UN development goal is whether we can reduce inequality by 2030, so in the next 15 years. So I'm curious by a show of hands, do you believe we can reduce inequality in the next 15 years? Raise your hand if you think. So it seems like most people are in agreement. The other part of that question is, do you think we will reduce inequality <laughs> by 2030? I'm curious if we can raise our hands again. So about half. Um, I think that shows sort of the dichotomy that we're facing with this problem. People know it's a problem, but this belief, we aren't sure if we can tackle it. I'm curious to hear reflections from the panel on that. Uh, Christine was I, up with her yeah, hand first. I was, I, was, I was short, so I just want to take the, the opportunity of, to clarify yeah. one thing. One is, when we talk about inequalities, we talk about all sorts of things. And today, inequalities, understood as a very broad topic, have actually reduced over the course of the last 20 years, say 30 years, simply as a result of China bringing to a much you know, higher, everything being relative, level of income, masses of people from China. So if you look at the, the overall map of the world, inequalities have been reduced. Now if you look inside each and every territory, you look at China, you look at any country in Latin America, you look at many countries in the advanced economy group, inequalities have significantly increased. So I agree with you, it is complicated. And when we talk about inequalities, we have to really know what we're talking about. Second point, and I'll, I'll be super quick. President Obama last week uh, announced an executive order, if I recall, that would require any company with more than 100 employees to actually publish the difference between male and female wages at the same level of skills and for the same positions. That's critically important, why? Because, as you all know, Women in the same job with the same skills today earn 79 cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. Eight years ago, when he started his terribly difficult job, it was 77 cents. 
Now calculate how long it will take to get to one dollar each, <laughs> 80 years. So yes, we will, but it's going to take a lot of time unless we work really hard on at least that aspect of the inequalities. And do you think that the big hindrance here is just societal perceptions of women, that we're still kind of fighting these old stereotypes? So what's the big hindrance to moving faster on these issues? Can I back to the question before that question? But when you ask about whether we can address the inequality in our lifetime, that mm -hmm. is to 2030, if it is equality of income, you are not going to have that one. But if the, we address the issue which is much important, and that's touch the issue sense of justice, that is equality of opportunity, then that ambition could be delivered in 2030. Mm -hmm. Why? Because actually this is really a sign of whether you are going to address a good policy. Creating basic services. You are all maybe coming from many different countries. I come from Indonesia which is if you're born as a girl, baby girls, if you are from the rural area, you are removed from the capital city, then you are not going to get the basic services just like the one who born in capital city of Jakarta. So that kind of failure can be addressed. And that's exactly, you're talking about any country providing basic services is gonna be the first necessary, of course not sufficient, to actually tackle this inequality. The second is, of course, the distortion which is coming from the law. For example, Christine mentioned about gender. You mentioned about gender. The World Bank have a survey every two years in 173 countries. All country, high, middle, low income country, they always have a law that discriminate women against men. Even in France, you are or talking, Indonesia. or Indonesia, <laughs> or in the United States we are talking about. I mean, they have a labor law is allow, not allowing women to work in the area that can carry, and they should carry a burden more than 25 kilo. This is only around five to seven kilo as, uh, years of children weight, but women cannot work in the area that will carry the weight above 25 kilo. That will definitely excluding the woman from any potential job. Mm -hmm. Not to mention any discrimination which is much more familiar that, that is really substantial for many women. Land titling, access to finance. 25% only women in developing country can have an access to finance or have a bank account. That really create quite a lot of, and that's explained why within this 62, mostly they are male. This is happen everywhere, and that's why when you talk about whether you can tackle it, I think I have the optimism I can share many of you saying that yes, it can be tackled, because it actually requires sometimes an action that can be done through this kind of mobilization or perception that equality is actually right, right morally and smart economically. Yeah. Let's stay on this topic of gender and equality. I think there's a lot more to say there. I want to give Lord Malik a chance to weigh in. Well, well thanks, Heather. I mean, I, I, I just want to go back to the hands in the air point and start from there because, you know, in 2000, I was addressing a, Swede, a town hall in Sweden, and Sweden is a bit Wellesley taken to a size of a country. <laughs> um, you know, uh, half its cabinet are women. It's a very progressive men and women alike. And then my question to them was, do you think we're going to halve poverty by 2015? Mm. And many fewer hands went up than went up today about the impact on inequality because we'd lost confidence at that point that we could make these tremendously high-impact, far-reaching changes in economic distribution. It happened with poverty, and I think it will happen here as well with inequality, but only if we focus on the really kind of policy influenceable inequalities, which are indeed things like gender uh, and those kinds of issues that we were hearing about of rural women far from home with girls. What are the package of things that starts to address their issues? And we need to get away 
fr frankly powerful though it is as a sort of opening line from the Oxfam point, because, you know, I, I don't want to get too deep into the methodology, but, you know, just one obvious point. A couple of years ago, they said 350 people uh, had as much wealth as the bottom half of the world. Well, what happened after over the last few years? And, you, and, you know, they they said in their report that the poorest half had lost a trillion dollars and the top half had made one. It wasn't that that had happened at all. It was that the dollar had appreciated against other currencies. Oh, and so, you know, there's some sort of silliness in it, which we just need to be careful about and to focus on these real issues, which are middle classes versus working classes versus rural groups in country after country. And how do we start addressing the, the differences of wealth between them as well as between the two genders? And, and not think it's some sort of epic struggle between the top 60 uh, and, and the bottom three and a half billion. Because if we think at those terms, we're never going to solve the problems. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to weigh in now. <laughs> Well, yeah, I don't want to do that just for the point of having an argument, uh, particularly with you. Uh, but, you know, whether it's 62 or 352 really doesn't make a huge difference. And what matters is two questions in, in our view is, number one, is excessive inequality conducive to better growth, more inclusive growth, more sustainable growth, better justice, better societies, or is it not? Now, we, we do, at the IMF, we don't do research on all these aspects. We don't measure, you know, social fabrics successes, for instance. But we do measure uh, the growth relationship with excessive inequality. And certainly the latest research that we've produced tends to show that excessive inequality is not conducive to sustainable growth. Hmm. And that is really, I think, empirically and seriously demonstrated with or without the variation of currencies. I think the second question that also matters is, Will redistribution policies impair or help growth? And I think the, the, the latest research, not just by us at the IMF, but other uh, economic um, you know, professors and, and researchers, is that contrary to conventional wisdom, which was that redistribution policies are actually not conducive to progress and growth because people sit back and wait for the redistribution to happen. Actually, this is wrong. And good... Um, designed and well-implemented redistribution policies are actually, at worst, growth neutral, and at best, which is often the case, actually conducive to better growth and more sustainable growth. So I, I, I take a little bit of an argument well, no, with that. I mean, you, can't let, you can't let a UN man <laughs> position to the right of the IMF. Uh, <laughs> so so I, I, I clearly need to clarify. My point is all of that, that you need to do redistribution but don't, in terms of policy, get obsessed by the 62 at the top, because it is those broader redistributions which affect billions and deal with the inequalities between them, which are really going to change things. The problem with the people at the top is while national tax authorities are a disgrace that they're not taxing them much more heavily, um, the, 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 the difficulty is that they are, in many ways, the innovators who've introduced dramatic new global products and services that transform the world, because in that group are people like Bill Gates, uh, the CEOs of Facebook, other companies. And, you know, they certainly are people who are willing to give back. But again, there are going to be more who are produced by a global economy like them, people who've introduced something that has changed the world. And for better or worse, they get a global reward for it. The big issue is distribution in the sort of great middle, uh, the 99% downwards, where we can really influence policy by the kind of micro steps that reallocate things. And so that's my point, not to disagree with you at all. But in this case, because I, I think you're not questioning like Bill Gates' yeah. example. In many countries, when inequality is such a very serious issue, it is not just you are talking about injustice, yeah. but this small elite can capture yeah the state, and they really can distort a lot of things that can weakening the institutional capacity. You can even create a lot of rent-seeking behavior, which then creating all those distorted environment, which is make it even harder to address even the basic goals of 
addressing the issue of poverty, not to mention addressing the issue of equality or inequality in this case. So I think the danger is really that if you have a small group of people which can really distort it, the choice of the policy, which is not serving the wider public, but really serving their own interests, then you really have a really ser serious issue of this inequality. Mm -hmm. Well, not to play the role of diplomat, but I think we all agree on the stage and in the audience on the problem and the scale of the problem of inequality. We might differ on some of our stats that we use, but uh, let's really t dig down into possible solutions. I, I think Madame Lagarde began to take us down that path with this notion that redistribution, perhaps we need to revisit, could be a potential solution. Uh, what other solutions are your organizations working on or perhaps countries that you think are good models right now? Can I start maybe in this case? I mean, it's really different from country to country, region to region. Latin America may be coming from a very high inequality, but they made a very impressive progress in the past decade or in a decade and a half. That is because a lot of program in addressing the issue of equality of opportunity. In Peru, you have a program of Juntos, Bolsa Familia in Brazil, you have opportunities that now become prospera in Mexico. That really addressing the issue of inequality that they are now going down, although it's still in a very high. If you talk about Africa, which is the concentration of the poor now of the world, then you are going to address the issue of inequality coming from the rural and agriculture. So any program that can increase the productivity of the agriculture that can provide a much better income from the rural people, that definitely address the issue of inequality. In many middle income countries, the problem of this elite capture, the problem of not creating a growth which is inclusive enough, and that's why you have this Arab Spring, but that's in Asia, we have the ASEAN crisis. You can have a very impressive high growth, but not inclusive not. It's not creating job that will provide a hope, especially for the youth. That's going to create quite a lot of problem in not only sense of justice, but can create a social conflict. Mm -hmm. So it's really depend on where you are and the policy option. But for sure, you have to correct the policy distortion. You should have what you call it legitimacy of an institution mm -hmm. who can really safeguard the interests of the public. Madame Lagarde, you mentioned China earlier. Yeah, I, do you mind if I go back to Peru? Because I think sure. uh, Shimuliani is absolutely right uh, to refer to Latin America. And I was looking at numbers because I wanted to uh, get that right. What's really interesting about Peru in particular, I mean, Colombia has made progress as well. Brazil did to a lesser extent in my view. But Peru is a really interesting case because it demonstrates that number one, when you remove from the legal, um, architecture of the country, a, a piece of legislation, actually it's more complicated what they did. They passed a constitutional reform that actually purposes to eliminate any gender related discrimination, mm -hmm. not just in the legal system, but also in the traditional uh, system of Peru, which is, you know, sort of a subset of the formal legal system, but which is critically important in the way in which communities are organized. So back in the late 90s, they changed the constitution, banned any of those discrimination, and there was within five years a significant change in actual growth of mm -hmm. the country, uh, which really was related to the fact that women who had been barred from having access, having title to land, having access to finance, being able to actually decide for themselves, actually that led them to the job market and to develop the creation of value. Now, it's not all rosy in Peru, let's, let's face it. Uh, there are still lots of discriminations, and the, uh, the, the, the state of peace that Peru is in now has also a lot to do with the renewed growth. But it's very clear that with better income distribution, with more growth, with a better macroeconomic framework, with less inflation, 
there were many more opportunities for Peruvian people to have better access to income, better access to jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's a clear example of good, sound macroeconomic policies, good legal determination, and also some reforms along the way by cash transfers. If your kids go to school, you will get access to cash benefits. Those are the kinds of things that have been proven to actually work in a country like Peru, but in other countries as well. Yeah. Secretary Albright, do you want to jump in? I know on an earlier panel you were speaking about the importance of land rights and the work of Hernando de Soto in that area. Well, interestingly, yeah. he's from Peru, and so uh, <laughs> part of, I think, he has had an influence uh, in this. I think the questions for me come down to um, whether there are specific policies. I think a little what, Mark, you were saying. I think this is a huge issue. Uh, and we can have a lot of slogans, but the bottom line is, to what extent can the institutional structures in wherever, uh, in fact, begin to move on some specific policies, whether they are to do with land rights or uh, generally in terms of schools, urban-rural issues. And what I would hope that in the next years we can focus, I, I've been fascinated by the Sustainable Development Goals. One, there are an awful lot of them, but they do have a bunch of targets under them hmm. that are some related to national action and some related to non-governmental organizations and some related to what the international system can do. And I think what we need to do is to look at it kind of step by step um, to look at what policies can be done where in fact the national institutions can take a step. One of the issues that we all talked about when we were in school was what comes first, political development or economic development. Mm -hmm. They obviously go together because people want to vote and eat. And so the bottom line is trying to figure out what the, what the structure is. The thing that I'm afraid of as I read the papers in the morning or listen to you is that <laughs> in many ways, things are getting harder uh, because of the lack of faith in institutions that I think just generally. I think the migrant and refugee situation is playing a role in this because you have you ever seen so many people that are not treated equally or even decently? Um, and then the question of how we deal with various other cultures where inequality seems to be part of the mantra. So I think those are, I think we're entering a period where this is even, I would always raise my hand that things could get better, but the bottom line is I do think that we are entering a period where all this is gonna be even harder, which is why I would focus on specific policies. Right. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm with Madeline. It was what she said much better than I did what I was trying to say earlier, which is, you know, it, this is a matter of a lot of very specific things in different countries that we, that we need to get right. The great advantage of these goals is it creates a bit of a league table of progress. What we saw with the Millennium Development Goals was it created really quite competitive pressures. When I ran UNDP, I get governments calling me when the latest results came in, coming out, complaining about their standing, that we'd mis mismeasured it or something. It, it, it drives public policy. But the actual solutions are going to differ country by country. Land rights in Peru are different to Ghana, as Hernando would be the first uh, to, to affirm. Uh, and so are the issues around redistribution. Uh, for example, um, gender seems to be a little bit less of a multiplier of, 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 of inequality in Africa than it is in Asia. Other factors are rather bigger in the case of Africa, the absence of infrastructure to draw people into you know, a trading and modern economy. So you know, we can't prescribe single solutions for it, but what we can do is prescribe, and that's where the reports like Oxfam are so important, is we can all get commonly angry about it, we can set it as a global goal, we can measure it, and we can hold countries to account both as their citizens and as their international supporters, when countries start to lag behind others. And we can, when they do, not just bring the stick to bear to them of public opinion, which may or may not work, but we can make the arguments that my fellow panelists have made, which is if you don't 
crack the problem of inequality, you are putting economic growth on the side. You are leaving women who are not as deployed and fully utilized as they should be. You're leaving other groups who could be productive workers and consumers. You're leaving them out of the economy. You're the ones tying your hand behind your own backs. I, can I give you two, two tips? Um, because we talk, we're talking at, of country-specific solutions, and I think you are absolutely right that uh, they have to be country-specific. Equally, in the advanced economies, where there is also inequality, and, and sometimes growing inequality, I think it's pretty much a proven case that if policies in relation to tax are changed to the benefit of individual taxation, not family taxation, as is often the case in many countries, where typically the second earner, remember the 79 cents to a dollar? So the second earner is marginally much more highly taxed than the first earner, acts as a disincentive to the second earner actually earning anything. So that a tax change in the way in which income taxation is assessed can make a difference and has been proven to make a difference. Second example. If you look at a country like Japan, I don't dare look at a country like the United States because I think it applies equally, but maybe not to the same extent. But we have a great working relationship with Japan, and I will be happy to mention Japan. It, we do with the US as well. Uh, but the Japanese economy is very interesting. Aging population, big shortage of qualified labor, fantastically educated Japanese women. And yet, if you look at the contribution of Japanese women to the Japanese economy, it's much lower than the average in OECD countries. And Prime Minister Abe actually is very, was very concerned about it, listened to what various policymakers around the world told him. I, I asked us actually to produce a bit of work on that. And bottom line, it really revolves around some cultural changes, which we cannot you know, do much about, but also with child care centers. Mm which were in very limited numbers in Japan, and whereby by increasing the budget lines associated with childcare center creation, by asking the cities of Japan and asking the big companies of Japan to set up childcare centers, there is now a significant increase in the par female participation in the job market of Japan, which I think is very welcome by many of them, as well as by the Japanese economy. So those are two things. Yeah, you know, change the taxation system to make it individual specific and not family specific, and make sure that there are childcare centers that can actually help parents, young parents, you know, raise their children in a safe environment, not too far from work, so that it, it liberates those that are typically associated with raising children to actually also go to work if they want to. Yeah, I just want to pause there for a second. In, a, in just a few minutes, we're going to open the floor to questions from the audience. We'll have about a half hour for those. So I think they're going to bring some microphones down. You can also, if you're watching this on the live stream, you can tweet us questions. The ha it's at Albright I-N-S-T, and the hashtag is Albright Dialogue. So we encourage questions from viewers uh, around the world as well. So, Secretary Albright, you alluded to the refugee crisis that's going on, and certainly the Syrian refugee crisis we're all very well aware of, and it, it brings together a lot of these inequality issues and about how hard it is to solve them around the world. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll take a page from your book and, and just throw out the hard questions of what do we need to do to solve the Syrian refugee crisis, and, and do you see this? <laughs> Uh, do you see this as a result of inequality? Is this sort of an extreme example of inequality in the world today? You're asking. <laughs> yeah. You're asking our I guess we can ask, anyway, maybe we'll start with Secretary Albright. Uh, you've, you've said several times, <laughs> <laughs> you said to your panel, you've said several times that, uh, <laughs> That helping Syrian refugees is obviously a moral, the morally right thing to do, and that's why we need to do it. But you've also stressed that it's the economically beneficial thing to do, and that it helps security. It helps make a more stable world. Can you explain all, all those issues a little bit, why you see it not just as a moral, but... Well, first of all, I think as we look at the Middle East, generally, it is as insecure as anything that any of us have seen uh, in terms of... 
uh, kind of the snowball effect or the ink spot effect of everything spreading. And all of a sudden, having, instead of looking at the world as populated by similar people, uh, what is happening there is a division slowly by slowly in terms of either various uh, sectarian issues, uh, historic issues, a great division. And I think in order to have equality, you can't all of a sudden keep separating people into smaller and smaller groups who actually uh, are proud of their identity but hate the people next door. Mm -hmm. So it is endemic in terms of trying to create more and more inequality. I think part of the issue here, though, is if you look at what is happening, if one were to analyze Europe, uh, I think, Christine, the way you just did Japan, you have an aging population uh, in many countries. You do have uh, a need for workers of various kinds. Um, and if, you, if life were logical, you might be able to use some of the people that are well-educated coming out of the Middle East in order to help in terms of alleviating some of the uh, work-related issues. However, because we are into some kind of identity crisis, um, uh, we are not doing that, and it's testing the whole institutional right. structure. So I think we are dealing with a humanitarian issue of major proportions, but also an institutional problem in that the institutions we have are incapable of dealing with this. Mm. So the European, Malcolm, uh, uh, Mark, we were talking about the institutional effect on the EU, uh, clearly on how organizations are able to deal with it, and, if I may say so as a former diplomat, the idea that we can't even figure out who should be sitting at the table um, in terms of trying to solve the problem uh, I think shows the, the uh, level of difficulty. I was trying to kind of, I actually was in a meeting in which I turned to the person next to me and said, the Cold War was a piece of cake in comparison to this. Um, there was the, the world was divided between the red and the red, white, and blue. Uh, and at this point, it is hard to keep track of who is who. Mm -hmm. And the institutional structures are not helping equality at all right. in terms of trying to figure it out. So I think we're at a very difficult time in terms of social contracts, all the issues that we've been talking about. Well, that's why the World Bank in this case, I think that's also linked to, to, don't forget that the Arab Spring was triggered by this exclusion and inequality. The Bozizi that is self-emulating, that's, that's, and the, question about whether you are going to address the issue on the Syrian refugee, especially from the humanitarian or the development and institutional point of view. The recipient country, especially in the Middle East, Jordan, Lebanon, mm. even Turkey, Turkey, this is really like a big issue. What Bank doing uh, uh, with the government in order to address the issue even on the basic services? How could you imagine like a country suddenly have 25% of your population increase that really stress the school system, the health system, sewerage, sanitation, or even in this case on a job and, 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 and the social issue. And that creates a lot of problem in terms of how you are going to sustain it. There is an idea of our middle uh, Middle East strategy in dealing with many countries post-Arab Spring is actually anchoring this social trust. That is how you are going to build the social trust again. So it's no longer just putting money in a budget and for you, for the government to land, but how you are going to actually influence or helping the government in creating more transparency accountability, even very basic, for example, your budget now need to be announced. So public knows exactly how much money you collect, how much money you are going to spend, where, for what, and who's the beneficiary. That kind of thing that can really create and rebuild the social fabric and social trust is very critical. That, of course, address the issue, which is also very, very difficult in a way when the economic situation now also f suffering from the slowdown, right. that is the youth unemployment. Right. Because if you look at the Middle East and North Africa, 
the growing demographic population is just very alarming. Yeah. It's very high. And that's why they have the demographic, which is very dominated by the, the young population, which is there with the information technology. They know, they hear, they listen, they watch. They have high as aspiration, but they cannot get even right. education and then the job. So that is really the area which we really need to focus more. Are the microphones uh, coming down the aisles for people to start, yeah, start lining up for questions? That would be great. Sure. To, just to pick up, can, I think I would be remiss at CNN Money if I didn't press now Madame Lagarde a little bit. Uh, your colleague here mentioned the global slowdown. You've called the economy this year disappointing and, and uneven. Do you think that we're headed for a recession? Or do you know, no, not no, quite no. that bad? No, um, no, no, how no, is no. this slowdown going to affect the ability to get these policies um, underway to try to help inequality? Well, I Sri Mulyani's point is completely well taken. When you have, you know, in the advanced economies, which are generally the donors countries, when you have less fiscal resources available because growth is slower, you give less, you contribute less. So the donors packages that uh, countries like Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey to a certain extent, uh, need to receive in terms of grants, not loans, is going to be reduced. That, that's clearly mm -hmm. uh, the case. No recession, because uh, while we say that growth is going to be modest and uneven, uh, we still forecast a growth of 3.4 in 2016, and possibly 3.6 in 2017. Now granted, forecasting 2017 in the current situation is a bit of a, a stretch, but we don't see a recession, we see not as good growth as we would like to see it to respond to the 200 million people who are looking for jobs at the right. moment, to make sure that advanced economies can actually provide those donors packages that would help countries like Jordan and Lebanon that are acting as buffers to what initially is the most important question, which is how do, how do we sort it at home? You know, I remember visiting Zatari, which is a big refugees camp in Jordan, and talking to a group of, of women who had lost most of their families in Syria during the, the war that was 18 months ago, so it, I'm sure it's worse today, and talking to them and asking them what they wanted. And they said, we want to go home. And I said, well, you've lost your husband, your sons, and, and you told me that your house is, is destroyed. What's the point? It's home. It's touching the land of Syria. So that's the critical priority, and I really hope that diplomats can do the best they can having the representation of as large the opposition is, and as many, I hope, godfathers and godmothers for this initiative, so that peace is initially, you know, hopefully beginning to settle in that country soon, so that we can then move to the next countries with grants, so that they are better equipped, and then you know, then the dialogue can begin amongst the European countries to see how best they can respond to what hopefully will be a reducing flow of refugees coming to those European countries. Because I agree with you, Madeleine, it is putting those institutions at risk. And what has been an extraordinary democratic construction over the last 60 years or so is at risk under the, 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 the rise of populism in some of those countries and the clash, not of civilizations, but the clash of needs of those who have nothing and want something, and those who have a lot but are not really prepared yet uh, to integrate those refugees. By the way, it's one area where we actually recommend a degree of inequality. Because, you know, if you look at the flow of refugees that are coming to Germany, for instance, which is where we have the most uh, data, it would actually help the integration of those refugees if there was an element of training and eventually slightly reduced salaries for those who joined the job market. Now, I know it's shocking to say that, and some people will say, how can you, you know, advocate those level of inequality? Well, it would actually help the integration. And uh, we've done one more thing, and I'll, I'll stop there. We've tried to measure the benefit for those countries that would be prepared to integrate well the flow of refugees. 
because the typical tendency is to say, it's going to be a fiscal cost for me because I'm going to have to give uh, special welfare benefits, I'm going to provide some housing, I'm going to have to provide some education. But down the road, in a fairly short mm. to medium term, there is actually benefits to be had mm. because of the fiscal uh, space that is being used and that improves demand, because of the increased consumption, and bottom line, on average, within the European Union, it's a potential increase of 0.2% of growth. Wow. You'll say, this is not much, 0.2%. <laughs> well, in countries where growth is 1.2 to 1.5, to have another 0.2 is actually a plus. But that music is not being heard for mm. the moment. One mm. day it will be heard, yeah. I hope. We'll continue singing it. <laughs> Well, as expected, the Wellesley women and beyond are ready for you. So uh, I think we're going to take a page out of a prior panel, and we'll have maybe three people ask questions, and then the panel can address sort of holistically some of the questions that have been asked. Start here. Great. If you could say your name, please. Sure. Jamie Anderson, class of 2005, proud classmate of this moderator, Heather Long. And um, I've been with the Albright Fellows all weekend, and I want to thank Secretary Albright and all of you for joining us. These women are incredible. Your legacy is well established in, in what they're doing. Uh, I have a question about the theme of women's empowerment and involvement, because it's something that we take for granted at this historic all-women's institution, and it's something that you have all highlighted is critically important. And I'm wondering, is that still an uphill battle in discussions that you have with various constituencies across the world? Is it something that people philosophically are at the point of agreeing with, but now we need to put it into practice? Just sort of wondering if we've reached a tipping point or not. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take one from here. Thank you so much for coming to Wellesley. It's been an honor and an extraordinary experience to hear from such a powerhouse panel. My name is Amal Chima, and I'm part of the current cohort for Albright Fellows. My question is, Ambassador Elizabeth Cousins spoke to how the SDGs were a change from donor assistance to investment and integration of developing countries into policy making. Given that a major and well-known criticism um, of the IMF and the World Bank is that they favor Western policies and consequently may perpetuate inequality that way, how will or how do, do institutions like the IMF and World Bank find a place in supporting the SDGs on an individual and country-specific basis. Thank you, and we'll take one more and then give a pause. Yeah, I actually have some questions from Twitter. Oh, Did great, you? yeah, why don't great. you, can you just read um, one, maybe? Yeah, so, so uh, my name's Kathleen McGovern, I am the social media, one of the social media people for the event, and um, a lot of people would like to hear about ref the refugee crisis and how that impacts inequality, and um, specifically, uh, Sama Ahmed, I'm sorry if I said your name wrong, is wondering how can we talk about inequality without talking about wars and global military industrial complex? Wow. <laughs> well, there's a lot of places to start. I don't know if um, <laughs> Madame Lagarde or Ms. Indrawati, if you would want to address you know, your organizations, the IMF and the World Bank, were, were specifically called out uh, in terms of your policies, if you would like to respond to that second question. Yeah. Go Sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I think the second question is much easier because it's really linked with the bank. How we as an institution, as the World Bank, uh, supporting this sustainable development goal. A lot of within the 17 goals of the SDG is really overlap with us, whether you are starting from the poverty, but many other issues, in, including the gender mm -hmm. injustice, uh, the institution, which is I think is, is, is going to be the, the much tougher. But the question that really need to be asked, and you're actually addressing this issue, this is need a strong ownership of the country, just like the climate change agenda, in which each country is submitting what they call it national intention to reduce the carbon. This is also going to need for a country to have the ownership of how they are going to integrate this global commitment against sustainable development in this case within their own national context. 
The World Bank, with the presence of more than 135 countries in the world, many uh, other most actually low-income countries, we are working very closely. Every time we work now, we look at the system through a very systematic, and by the way, the alumni of this Wellesley is actually one of our director who's in charge for the poverty. And this is really a very important job in making diagnostic work at the country level, what hampering a country to address the issue of poverty and bottom 40% that is sharing prosperity, how to increase the sharing prosperity. And within that context, we are going to identify what is the area which is the government own have the policy and what area which is need more support, whether this is money, whether this is technical assistance, or this is really more catalytic with the private sector role is going to be very critical. So that, that is, I don't think, my own experience, the perception that this is seen as a hmm. Western policy, or we call it Washington consensus versus is less now. The world is really more battling with the real issue about how we are going to address this issue of injustice, access of education, access of health, uh, job, and what is the role of the private sector which is really needed. Yeah. Th that is my sense on that. On the first question about the woman empowerment, um, are we really now in a better situation? It's better in terms of sharing a lot of information regarding that the inequality, especially on the gender side, is there. The World Bank, again, in this case, have a new gender strategy which is launched this year. This is going to be really more ambitious. In the past, we just want to make sure that when you design a policy or project, there is a gender equality awareness in the design of this project. But now we are actually moving from the input into real result. So it's really changed just thinking about that, yes, this project is actually designed with a gender awareness. Now we are questioning a much tougher question about whether this kind of project really change and achieve a result in improving the equality. So that is going to be a much, much tougher. Part of it is really about very basic like statistic and data which is not disaggregated between male and female. So if you look at the statistic, how, how many people poor, they actually just the number of people, they really not disaggregated by gender. Mm. And that really make disguising quite a lot of actually very important aspect of policy that will address much deeper rooted of the poverty because of gender equality. So that is that, that the area that we are now investing more. There is a question regarding um, the access of the asset, like land titling, the access for women in really dealing with the borrowing and a bank account, because that really matters a lot. It seems like very basic, but many countries in the world is actually don't have those access for women even to open the bank account, to have their own house title under her name so that it can become the collateral for them when they borrow for, uh, for any of the economic activity. So that is the area which we really look uh, and really pushing very hard. Of course, this is in addition to the many of the issue, whether just gender equality, whether you are talking about domestic violence, and even what we call it the first generation of gender equality, for example, like basic services, mortality, maternal mortality, which is I think, still quite a problem in many countries in the world. Yeah. And the World Bank really has a terrific report out. Uh, from the Women, Business, and Law is another thing which really identifying what is the law and legislation yeah. in 173 countries, which is actually is quite pervasive all over the world. So you want to yeah. please jump in? I'll, I'll try to be quick. The IMF normally doesn't venture in those areas. You know, inequality, inclusive growth, gender, discrimination, Climate change, not typical of the IMF. Over the last four years, we've navigated a little bit in those areas. And, you know, many people say, well, this is not the core business of the IMF. You should be doing fiscal. 
which I say it happens to be microcritical. <laughs> so we are now into that field as well. And I'll just take one example to show you how we take the various sort of business lines of the IMF um, to make a difference. I'll take climate change to go back to a topic we discussed at lunch. And particularly the project of removing subsidies that are paid around the globe in many countries for using fossil fuel. Mm. What we did is we did a lot of research to begin with to make sure that we had our you know, facts right. Then we published. And we published on the issue of price it right. Get all these externalities in so that you know exactly what is the cost and what should be the cost of fossil fuel. Second, we did a study of all those countries that had actually tried to remove subsidies, your country included, because under her leadership as finance minister, there was an attempt to significantly reduce subsidies in Indonesia. But so we did a study of the best practices, the worst practices, what worked, what didn't work, which was made available to all countries. And then we have the luxury of having to review each and every economy of the 188 members that we have in the institution. And on a voluntary basis, countries can actually say, well, look into our policies in relation to gender inequality, into use of fiscal space to subsidize the use of fossil fuel. And by having access to those economies and being able to actually identify how much saving there could be, how much additional fiscal space could be used to actually improve education, improve health, as opposed to support the use and the indiscriminate and excessive use of fossil fuel, countries could actually be better off. So we use the whole range of services we have. Research, comparison of best practices, publication, policy advice, and technical assistance, because on the ground, you do that much better than we do, but we also provide the fiscal technical assistance to countries that are prepared to move from subsidizing the use of fossil fuel to actually paying for better education, paying for better health. And it's actually more conducive to much more sustainable growth. Can I add this, this has, because this is very important. It's, you see how different when the institution had it or chaired by the woman, right? You can see it. <laughs> But, no, but this is really the real experience. When you are a policymaker and you are a woman at the same time, like this is the real issue when you try to remove the untargeted fossil fuel subsidy. You know that this is going to create huge protests from people. Yeah, then you try to change to become a targeted subsidy, targeted for the poor, using the cash transfer. But if you are not really coming from woman which is very sensitive of not only the perception of inequality, but really that you are suffering. You really have to design this policy which is really then talking about if this cash transfer will be paid to the male household head, what is going to happen? It end up buying a, a cigarette or going to whatever. <laughs> so when I was finance minister, by design we said that this cash transfer can only be paid to a mother. Wow. Because wow, it's really, when a woman receiving this cash transfer, they pay more, they're thinking more about their children. So first going for food, making sure that this is going to be for my children to go to school, they are going to be having enough, hmm. whether from the uniform, books, and so on. Hmm. So it's really make a lot of difference when you have the ability to see this within maybe more like policy making process by putting this, the gender dimension in, on it. All right, I think we're just gonna pause there and, and, and let a few more we questioners. Just, uh, there's one question we've not the last answered, one which on is them. the Twitter one. And it was a guy's question because it was about <laughs> guns and the military industrial complex. So <laughs> as the representative of that besieged sex, I need to just answer it. All right. Um, because I think also, you know, it's so important. And in fact, 
Fortunately, probably after the thing had been tweeted, we did talk about Syria because it's absolutely right. You cannot talk about inequality without talking about war and failed states. The great disproportion of the world's poor in the next 20 years are going to be in those states. It is those states which are going to be the refugee-producing mm. states. Now, I'm only going to make one point here because of, in the interest of time. We can look at them as this big, fat development problem that is going to cost a lot of money and a lot of time. Or we can also look at them, in many cases like Syria, as just a failure of old-fashioned diplomacy. I, I think Madeleine and I agree that Syria could have been solved a few years back by more ambitious, more focused more serious and earnest diplomacy than the countries involved were willing to apply. Because it wasn't, it's metastasized into a conflict that has put a million refugees on the shores of Europe, uh, which has drawn in all kinds of international actors, which has divided countries which previously overcame ethnic difficulties and were relatively united. This didn't have to happen. This was a diplomatic failure of an astonishing quantum, which you know we mustn't let happen again, which is why Madeleine and I are so keen on this issue of strengthening international institutions and having robust foreign policies uh, in places like Washington or London. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nadia DiCarlo. I'm an econ major from the class of 2001. Thank you again for being here today. It feels great to be in a room with my idols on a Sunday. Um, I wanted to ask you as world leaders, what do you do to navigate or to deal with corruption um, that is very oppressive and a clear deterrent to inequality? I was wondering, you know, Corruption can be from corrupt politi politicians to uh, the, oppressive, uh, the exploitation of women and even terrorism. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on this because there is widespread corruption and obviously terrorism is um, rampant. And I want to know what are those tools that you use to kind of go around that Thank or you. obliterate it? Why don't we jump over here? Yes, hello. My name is Louise Ross. I'm a psychologist and a writer. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm glad that um, climate change was mentioned um, because it, it addresses the question I want to ask, which is, um, in the future when coastlines may be flooded, there may be the potential for hundreds of millions of environmental refugees. And I was wondering where the discussion is going among countries on how to handle hundreds of millions of refugees and the freshwater and housing crisis that will develop there. Thank you. Hello, dear panelists. Um, I'm Moja, class of 2018, uh, personally an entrepreneur as well. So um, I think my question is, we've touched a lot on public policies, and I'm interested in knowing your perspectives on the unique rules that social enterprises can play um, hmm. in solving, addressing global inequality issues relatively to uh, government organizations or nonprofits. Thank you. All right, we'll pause there. We have, I call it the three C's, corruption, climate change, and computers, or she starts social enterprises too. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to pick up on either any of those three topics to start. Um, Secretary Albright, we... Well, let me just say that um, I keep returning to the same theme, which are institutional structures. And corruption, the only way it can be gotten rid of in countries is by the rule of law. Uh, and then trying to figure out um, who is doing what in terms of taking uh, money. Uh, we've been talking about Ukraine. Um, here, the IMF has done an amazing job in providing some funds, but there continue to be questions about corruption there. That is, or the president of Nigeria is now trying very hard to change the situation uh, in that country question corruption. And others have talked about corruption as the cancer of the system. And I do think that that is something that has to be attacked in terms of, um, and it can only be done through institutional structures, I think, and punishment, frankly. Uh, I do think that there are issues that become so large, again, in order to deal with the climate change and coastlines and all that, there has to be some kind of a sense of who is responsible for dealing with it, whether it is through a governmental system or 
to get, I kind of took the last question a little differently in terms of social or whether there are private sector, whether non-governmental organizations or uh, in companies that can be partners in terms of dealing with some of these problems. And I believe yes, because these issues are too big for governments to deal with alone. And some of the issues of inequality or buildings or corruption are also things that have to be dealt with in the public and private sector together. Lord Mullock Brown, you spoke to that last night. Do you want to make that point? I, I do want to thank you. I mean, I, 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 my only worry about our whole conversation so far has been we have had governments and official funds at the center of it. Right. And yet, really, the scale of the development challenge we face as a global community is beyond the capacity of government and international institutions. You know, ODA rate, as I, runs at something like 120 billion plus a year. The SDGs have been co costed at two to three trillion dollars a year. But it's not just money. It's also the innovation that social entrepreneurs and straight business people uh, bring, whether it's microbanking and some other things I uh, mentioned yesterday. So, and, and of course, this all has an impact on inequality because if, in fact, the main economic actors going forward are not the state, uh, but an increasingly large private sector, even in quite poor countries, the whole issue of dealing with inequality in that changed economic context of in increased private enterprise is, is not to be overlooked. But if your first goal is to get growth, create jobs, then I think bringing social entrepreneurs and the private sector right to the heart of the development equation is, you know, it seems at one level a simple thing to say, but in truth, it's a very radical thing to say uh, because it turns on its head uh, the whole idea of development, which was grant or when it was not grant and loan based, was through governments and uh, a thicket of regulations and laws to try and make sure things were done in a correct way. Now we're saying even marginal and economically weak and politically weak people may need to also be helped by an enhanced role for the private sector. Mm -hmm. And I think it's right, but it also will present all kinds of policy challenges as to how we protect the poor and the weak in a new, more business-oriented model of development. Mm -hmm. We could probably say a lot more, but should we take a few more questions yeah. to get some more voices in? Please start us off. Hi, um, my name is Barrett Paxson Tarnay. I was a fellow in 2014 and graduated from Wellesley Yellow class of 15. Um, so my question is related to China. Mm -hmm. I live and work in Beijing. And um, if you walk around the city and live there, you just open your eyes and you can see quite a lot of inequality. Um, from the poorest people selling me my breakfast on the street to the richest people in the skyscrapers above. Um, but at the same time, China's experienced a great growth in the middle class and uh, a large number of people moving out of poverty. So that brings me to two questions. The first one is, um, how has the rise of China and its economy and its presence in the world uh, affected global inequality, either positively or negatively, or maybe it's more complicated than that? And the second question is, must equality take, necessarily take the form of democracy? Hmm. Thank you. That's a question for you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. My name is Lillian Stewart, class of 2014. My question is kind of focusing on the US. So we were asked to raise our hands if we thought that a de decrease in global inequality could be achieved. And I did not my raise my hand. And one of the reasons for that is that within the US, we see kind of a lack of political will, where a lot of the rhetoric focuses around denying that the problem of inequality exists and has been rising for the past 30 years, or blaming the people on the bottom for their problems that are really caused by um, a social and economic system that causes them to be there. So my question for all of you is, given this climate, do you have any suggestions um, for making change when there is such political stagnation and do you see hope for the future with that? Thank you. All right, easy questions. Let's <laughs> <laughs> One more. Hi, everyone. My name is Zilpa Odwar. I am currently a sophomore here at Wellesley College studying international relations and economics. And my question um, is based off of some of the comments that were made earlier tonight, especially in regards to Africa and how the largest concentration of poor people are from Africa. But in the recent um, AU summit, 
um, President Robert Mugabe, who is highly criticized by a lot of governments all over the world, stated um, or was very critical about the United Nations and many other organized, or I guess, Western organizations, so to speak. And he received a standing ovation from all of the African leaders that were in the room. And so my question, um, and as an African myself, I recognize how their impact as leaders has on me and what I intend to sort of do and contribute back to the continent, which also leads to mistrust from a younger generation of people for organizations like the World Bank and the IMF because of the loans and the things that um, are implemented in these African states. So my question to you is how do you in your positions feel about um, this perception and how do you hope to change it during your time in office? And even if you can't, uh, be, uh, because I know that this is like a very long standing issue, how would you suggest that the younger generation of African leaders who are very skeptical of your organizations do the same? Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to hear from our panel now, and I see a lot of hands going up. <laughs> so, Can I take that one? Yes, that, that, that one, because I think that even more so than the, than the World Bank, the, the IMF is occasionally criticized for its action. And, you know, to actually receive a, a lesson as to how to operate from President Mugabe doesn't <laughs> fill me with joy and excitement, but I don't mean to criticize anybody, but I would, I would submit that, you know, whether it is through technical assistance, whether it is through training, whether it is through policy advice, I think that in many corners of the world, the IMF has been seen as a force for good and improvement of the situation. When we work on tax issues with a view to facilitating exchange of information, bringing about more transparency, reducing the number and hopefully eliminating one day the tax havens that are used by many corrupted people around the world to actually hide money away. I think we are helping a bit and we will continue to do so. Uh, when we're providing the technical assistance that I referred to in order to eliminate those subsidies that are not helpful and to direct fiscal spending on better health and better education system, I think we are helping you know, some improvement in the world. So I would very much hope, and I beg you, to actually look at what these international institutions do before you start uh, sort of pointing the finger, criticizing, running them down, and actually understanding what they actually do on the ground on a, on a prevention basis, sometimes on a precautionary basis, and unfortunately, on occasions, in emergency cases, when leaders in various countries have actually exhausted all options, generally the bad options, do no longer have access to the financial markets, cannot borrow themselves out of the terrible public finances in which they have put their own country, and when the last resort and the only you know, person in town to actually lend some money is eventually the IMF. So I would ask you to, I mean, you're in a fantastic, fantastic college where what you learn is to ask questions, is to have doubts, is to research, is to draw your own conclusions. I would beg you to do that in relation to international institutions, whether they are the UN, whether they are the World Bank, whether they are the IMF, the WTO, or other organizations. And before anybody, whether young or old, starts saying, stories of the past, they can't deal with these issues. That's not true. They can. They cannot do it in isolation, maybe as they would have 30 years ago, because the world was simpler. And as Madeleine said, in those days, people really didn't know what was going on elsewhere. Now people know, and they have good judgment sometimes, and they compare. But these international institutions, together with governments that are of good faith and that mean well, generally democracies actually, together with social enterprises, together with activists, together with those new players that have a voice, that should have a say and should have a way. All together we can improve the situation. But let's not do it by excluding those or focusing on that. Let's try to do it together. Thank Sorry. You. <laughs> I, think, 
I, I, I just want to share my experience as a finance minister when you have to deal with the World Bank IMF. I do understand and share the last question regarding this perception. But when you really like work in the country, really want to, to address the issue, whether you're talking about tax collection, corruption, or very awful public utility like power sector, or you're talking about the health or education, you're actually dealing with a much more detail of this, what you call it, battle of interests. It, can, it is easier in a domestic politic that you are pointing to that Western institution is bringing something, they are imposing conditionality to us. And many politicians, especially those who's very greedy, is actually the one who is going to like doing that more. Because they know that when you are going to start reform, their interest is going to be hit first. And, that of their and that's why they want their status quo not to be touched, especially by accusing whoever the reformer in your own country to be accused that they are collaborated with the external Western thing. So be very critical in this case because I was in that situation. At that time, it would be, it usually, I just talk to the IMF and World Bank. You are on the back seat. Let me face the political battle. I need to have this ownership to show that this is not the Washington agenda. If you're dealing with the corruption, you are going to collect tax from the very rich and they don't want to pay tax, then you are going to say that this is the tax for the people of Indonesia, not to collect because we want to comply with the IMF or with the World Bank. So just be very critical in this case because when the, the previous question about corruption, this is also another issue. I mean, the, currently maybe the good part, there are so many international cooperation to try to help own country effort to deal with that domestic issue. Whether you are talking about building the justice sex, sector, law enforcement, but most importantly, because Madeleine Albright mentioned about Nigeria, when the corrupt fund has been shifting outside the country, there is a, an effort to collect back through what you call it, star initiative, stolen asset recovery. We did it for the Tunisia, we did it for Nigeria in this case. So this is the area in which you see that the global cooperation can really help you because many of the nature of the issue is no longer local or national. They become global. They can evade tax outside. Climate change is not one problem. Again, Indonesia have a problem with the forest fire. It's polluting all over neighbor. But that have something to do with the corporate gov governance, which have something to do that they are located outside Indonesia. So that kind of thing that is actually provide you with a clear example that international cooperation is becoming even more and more and mm. more important. Thank you. I don't, um, can we have Secretary Albright or Lord Malik Brown? Uh, we haven't touched on the US or the China. Maybe we'll ask the Brit to give some advice to the United States. Well, I suppose on the US, if you want to reduce inequality, elect a Wellesley graduate. And at the risk of not stopping while I'm ahead, <laughs> I, I, would, uh, I, I would just add that you know it is a source of great disappointment to a you know someone who loves this country, who's married to an American, who spent half my working life based in the U.S. That American politics is betraying the people of America. Hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, this country deserves a better presidential debate and a better set of, set of presidential candidates than it has today. But then just a word on China and equality uh, and democracy. I mean, I actually do believe countries have to be democratic ultimately to preserve the progress towards equality and particularly to preserve the pluralism necessary not just for political innovation but actually for economic innovation and business innovation as well. So, you know, my view is that countries like China make a great mistake 
when they try to turn back the evolution. You don't need to be a Washington or Westminster democracy overnight and your final way of expressing the, your v citizens' views, channeling them into government choices, need be, could look totally different to the systems in the US or the UK. But the idea that you don't need systems that listen to people, respond to their demands, m manage and mediate De de conflicting demands between different groups of people, which we do by the ballot box, that you don't need some mechanism that does that, in my view, consigns your country to ultimately not being able to sustain high growth, high change, political economic society. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are almost out of time, but I want to just do our 30-second rule again and go down the panel and ask for your concluding thoughts. And in particular, keep in mind, we're speaking to a lot of fellows, to a lot of people earlier in their careers. How would you, what would you advise them or, or tell them to read or places you might tell them to travel as they look to shape their careers and, and for ways to help address inequality problems in the world. We've already hinted at some. Madame Lagarde offered some readings and some research that, that the students should do. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, she ruled them. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, maybe we'll. It's, it's, a, it's a bunch of studies that we've done on uh, inequalities, on uh, more inclusive growth, the role of women in economies, and uh, I'm very happy to give them to uh, the president, wherever she is. Madam President, it's, it's all yours for the <laughs> library. <laughs> Well, shall we start at this end with Lord Mullock Brown and let Secretary Albright have the last word? Right, well, look, I, I, at the age of 18, so younger than you all, uh, went off to, uh, to Africa for a year. My dad had been a South African Rhodes Scholar uh, who had died when I was young. For me, it was a journey to discover my roots. But it turned into a journey to which made my future because the chance and the opportunity not to be the busy international visitor who stays at the Hilton, but to hitchhike through Africa, you know, talking to pe ordinary people, uh, hearing about their aspirations. This, this, this was in the 70s, uh, quite, quite shor shortly after decolonization. To see the challenges they were facing of some bits of the country not working as well as they had when they were British or French civil servants, but others having a huge joy and aspiration and sense of opportunity for the future. That gave me a sense of respect for the people I have served in development and made me very sympathetic to the lady who asked the question about Mugabe and the Western institutions, because while I don't agree with her, I have seen profoundly, then and after that since, that there's always two sides of the argument. And that if in development and in diplomacy you ever forget that, uh, you become narrow, rigid, and unable to get your problem across the finishing line. Thank you. Well, Heather, I come from Indonesia. When I was born, and then I went to school, graduated, have the first job. I have only one president, never changed. So maybe like Mugabe situation. So it can create quite a lot of excuse to be pessimistic, to not having any future. But in any problem that you are facing, and I come from Indonesia, it's Muslim, Muslim country, a big Islamic country in the world. So you can always find an excuse to say that, oh, there are so many things, it's just too difficult to address. This is beyond me. This is beyond my pay grade. This is beyond my mandate. That kind of excuse is actually the first defeat in anything that you really want to achieve in your life. When you have a goal, and especially you connect with people, then you just do according to what your passion drives you. Use your critical thinking. The issue of inequality, climate change, gender, poverty, this is the issue which is actually require a generation with a lot of idealism, but also a strong passion to pursue. Don't easily give up and don't accept the thinking or the norm 
taken for granted. Develop your critical thinking and continue ask difficult questions because this is exactly the beginning of the solution. Mm. Well, I would say, first of all, that as Albright um, fellows, you're off to a good start. <laughs> I would second what uh, the only male representative on this panel has said. Because <laughs> it's roughly the same age, a bit younger than that, actually, at the age of 16, uh, my father passed away, and I was lucky to get a scholarship and to live in this country for a year, which actually uh, saved me. Hmm. And I would, I would start with embrace the world. Get out of your own box. You don't need to suffer the loss of a father or mother. But get out of your comfort zone and travel the world. Learn a language. Uh, be humble. Listen. Don't assume that you know it all because you've been to one of the best colleges in the world. So that's number one, embrace. Number two, I would say engage. Whatever you believe in, whatever is your fancy, whatever is your dream, and I hope it's as big as possible so you don't lose sight of it, as Faulkner would have said. But engage. Don't, as, as you said, don't give up. Continue to engage. And I would say also enjoy, <laughs> because that's an important part of life, that when you do embrace the world, when you do engage in whatever causes will motivate you, Enjoy it and make sure that you share with as many people as possible around you that enjoyment that you will draw from actually embracing and engaging. So best of luck when you do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's uh, hard to in really embellish on what has been said here. So let me just say, I believe that it's very important to always question your assumptions. Do not assume that every man is wrong and every woman is right. <laughs> uh, I would rather spend time with Mark Malik Brown than Sarah Palin. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's very important to <laughs> learn from each other and respect each other's views and be curious. And be a problem solver, which by virtue of the fact that you are Wellesley graduates and their friends, you already are. And I want to really thank everybody for all the participation during this symposium and uh, what the Albright Institute has come to mean. I am very, very proud to be a Wellesley graduate and associated with all of you and Wellesley forever. Go Blue.